Welcome to Outrage Overload, a science podcast about outrage and lowering the temperature. This is episode 28. We find ourselves in a world where people are constantly divided, where disagreements quickly escalate into conflict, and where it seems impossible to find common ground. And it has taken a toll on our mental and emotional health. There are a number of societal problems for which we seek solutions on this podcast. Political polarization is one of the biggest problems facing our world today. It is making it difficult to solve important problems such as climate change, economic inequality, and health care. Misinformation and disinformation are serious problems that are undermining our ability to have informed conversations about important issues. Due to the constant stream of outrage and other factors, people are becoming increasingly disengaged from civic life. This is a major problem because strong democracy requires an engaged and informed citizenry. All of this is taking a toll on our mental and emotional health. Some experts suggest a key to addressing these problems starts with focusing on our shared values and identities. And that's what we're going to talk about on this episode of the Outrage Overload podcast. I'm your host, David Beckmeyer, and on this episode, we have a renowned expert on political polarization and bridge building. His work is based on rigorous research and analysis, and he is known for his balanced and nuanced approach to these complex issues. So uh, my name is Matt Lewandowski. I'm a professor of political science uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, and I also uh, hold the Stephen and Mary Barron Chair in the Institutions of Democracy at the Annenberg Public Policy Center. So I've published a number of books. Uh, The kind of common thread connecting many of them has been a study of polarization, partisan media, and trying to understand uh, the divide in America. So in this most recent book, Our Common Bonds, I try to look at strategies that we might use to help bridge the divide between ordinary Democrats and Republicans. Dr. Lewandowski has published extensively on these topics in peer-reviewed journals and popular media outlets, and his work has been featured in major news outlets such as The New York Times, The Washington Post, and The Atlantic. Lewandowski is also actively engaged in promoting bridge building and dialogue across the political divide. In his latest book, Our Common Bonds, Using What Americans Share to Help Bridge the Partisan Divide, he argues that Americans are more alike than they think and that we can overcome our political differences by focusing on our shared values and identities. Here are a few of the ideas from the book that are particularly relevant to this show. First, Americans are more alike than they think. We share many of the same values and aspirations, even if we disagree about how to achieve them. Second, political polarization is not inevitable. It's caused by a number of factors that we talk about on this show, but we can take steps to reduce polarization, such as by supporting ranked choice voting and by engaging in respectful dialogue with people who have different views. And third, we can focus on our shared values and identities to build bridges. When we see each other as fellow Americans who share the same hopes and dreams, it becomes easier to find common ground and work together. Lewandowski acknowledges that this idea can be naive, and that there are real and significant differences between Americans. He also points out that focusing on our shared values and identities can be difficult when those values and identities are contested. You know, what I always tell people when we start these conversations is important to know that all of this is about amelioration of the problem, not cessation of the problem. So you're not going to make this go away with any of these strategies, right? It's about just trying to make things a little bit better and less divisive than they otherwise uh, would be. So I would just like to start there as sort of a a bit of a disclaimer. Overall, Lewandowski provides a balanced and nuanced perspective. He acknowledges that there are risks involved, but he also believes that the benefits outweigh the risks. He offers a number of suggestions for how to avoid the pitfalls, and he emphasizes the importance of being respectful of differences and engaging in honest and productive conversations. So listen in now for a refreshing change, a message of hope and unity with Dr. Matthew Lewandowski. (laughs) 
Yeah, so I mean, I know I haven't read all all your work because I saw you have quite a library uh, of of stuff you've you've done in this space, and you've been working in it for a while, um, which is cool. Um, so, but well, so first off, well, thanks for making time to come on on the show. I really appreciate it. No problem. So, you know, um, I like this book. I, I, I know we mentioned it a little bit, but I, I often have scientists and researchers on the show, and I usually try to finish those interviews with, you know, sort of what can we do? What are some ideas for, for improving the situation? And, you know, obviously sometimes we, we get some things, but it, it's often a bit pessimistic and they don't often have a lot to go. So I like this book that this almost our whole conversation is going to be about that topic. So, so, so that's kind of cool. Um, and unique <laughs> on the show to a degree. Um, so we I mentioned before that, um, I, I guess I'll start with the cross-cutting identities uh, stuff. That's been talked about as a, as a way to possibly diminish um, some of these angry responses to political messages. And you talk about sort of similar things in identifying our, our common bonds, obviously a lot more than that too, but as w one thing. And... Um, and we're often driven sort of away from that with sort of outrage media, and it's easy to sort of fall into what we don't, we easy to lose sight of, of those common bonds because we sort of get told the other side, this sort of caricature of, of people on the other side, and it's easy to kind of fall into that. Um, so, I mean, I think there's some real opportunity there to kind of bring out that truth about that there, is, there are some more of these common bonds. So, yeah, can you tell us about that a little bit? Uh, in terms of... of you know, identities, um, there's an idea that academics talk about called idea or identity complexity, right? And basically what that means um, is it's just sort of saying that we all kind of contain multitudes uh, within ourselves, right? That we tend to approach political problems through the lens of our partisanship because that's a salient identity for most of us most of the time. Um, but that's not the only identity that we have, right? So we might be parents, or we might be homeowners, or, uh, you know, we might be, you know, just sort of concerned citizens. Uh, we can also think about, um, you know, some more, you know, ones that might seem prosaic, but I think maybe offer kind of a deeper connection. And one important one I think is, is sports fandom. Um, that might seem really silly, um, but sports fandom is actually quite important to, to a lot of people. And so, um, I did some experiments in the book just using um, having people read some vignettes about someone from, you know, the other side. And so, you know, they're asked to kind of think about how they would think about someone who's from the other side, but like it's roots for their favorite uh, NFL team, which use the NFL because it's by far the most popular sport in America. Uh, but I think that kind of gives you a sense that but if you and if you do that, like people like the other person a lot more. Right. Um, the experiment I wanted to do for the book, but um, COVID happened, so uh, didn't wasn't possible. Was to bring uh, sports fans together uh, to say bond over, you know, uh, watching some like highlights or a game, you know, a game for their team. Right. So you know, here in Philadelphia, maybe getting some Phillies fans together. Um, but unbeknownst to them, some would be Democrats, some would be Republicans. Right. And so they would, you know, if they bonded over um the sort of shared experience of sports fandom right then that might give a bridge to then having a more productive political conversation and you might sort of say well that's kind of a silly trivial example and at some level kind of is but i think the deeper point that it brings to is that there are lots of different ways we might find commonality with other people and so uh one of the things that i like to tell people when i talk to to groups about how to maybe make this a little bit more practical and applied is that sometimes the personal can be a bridge to the political right and so that can be in two ways right the first way is using this to sort of find ways that we might connect with one another right in ways we don't expect and the second way can also be to having people you know share some of their personal experiences and the way those inform their political opinions um so when we talk uh, about you know, discussions, right, that can be kind of a powerful way for helping people to understand that people from the other side have some valid and legitimate rationales for their point of view. And it's not just all sort of, you know, fake news and prejudice and things like that that drive, you know, the other side to believe what they believe. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, one thing I like to think about um, in terms of, you know, this, I, I talk about this idea of lowering the temperature is, you know, if you're, if, if we've sort of convinced ourselves the other side is sort of this evil kind of level, I, I think that step to sort of radicalization is a much shorter step, right? And you start to dehumanize that side even more. Um, now, you know, and people will say, well, I'm not going to vote for the other side. I still don't like their policies or whatever. Um, but I still think even if, you know, we're not necessarily trying to take anybody to that step, uh, but we're trying to make it so we can at least have better dialogue. And and how much can that translate, do you think, to our politicians? I mean, it seems like now there's a lot of sort of litmus test stuff where it's even hard for uh, our politicians to sort of admit that they have friends on the other side and that they, they are willing to compromise and things like that. I mean, I mean, I know there's definitely benefits to, as individuals and, and in our community, to be less hostile and negative about each other. But do you think that can translate uh, to the to the politicians to a degree? I think it's a much harder problem to think about the translation into elite politics. So I'm going to answer it in a way kind of indirectly. So mm -hmm. um, we tend to think a lot in, in politics about the big, salient, very controversial things where the parties are just really divided, right? So, you know, right now we might think about in these debates over um, if we're down and, you know, whether or not we should have uh, medication abortion be available, right? Or that be an option for, for people who are seeking uh, access to abortion care, right? Or we might think about tax cuts or, you know, any of these sorts of things where the parties are very divided. And that's an important part of politics, but there's also a, a kind of a politics that sort of flies under the radar that we don't think about as much um, in terms of, you know, we did see some high profile examples of this in the, the last Congress. So think about, say, like the Chips and Science Act or um, the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Right. Um, so areas where there's not a lot of it's not just all about kind of national political debates and symbols, but people can kind of get more into actually solving problems. So I think that the kind of elite key is, the key for making elite politics work better, that is to say, is to finding ways to open up space for those sorts of discussions to go on where not everything gets sucked up into these you know, highly symbolic nationalized debates. But that's a very hard problem to solve because the incentives push a lot in the opposite direction. That's right. a way in which, ironically, all of the moves towards things like openness and transparency actually haven't necessarily been great for our politics because a lot of what needs to happen there is just sort of like backroom negotiation, like away from cameras where people can kind of hammer out differences and not just engage in grandstanding. Right. Yeah, exactly. The grandstanding aspect has become like some for some some of them, the only thing they do, like they don't really do any legislation anymore. Um. So I, I guess another thing I, I would ask, you know, I, I've, I, I've had some people on the show when we talk about things like co common bonds that sort of talk about, eh, that doesn't, the research doesn't say that that helps very much. Um, and I'm sure that this is all, another one of these things that there's probably an equal amount of people or, or, you know, there's probably scientists that sort of say both ways. But, you know, so what's, what's sort of your response to that? I mean, I know you've done some actual, you know, studies on this. Yeah, I mean, so... Again, I always preface this by saying that uh, there is no, there's no, you know, those kind of fake ads you see online, one weird trick to lose, you know, melt fat or whatever, like, that doesn't, it doesn't exist for those fake ads, it doesn't exist for this, right? There's not just some sort of little thing you're going to do that's going to magically solve this animosity. Again, it's about, you know, kind of lowering the the temperature of the, the debate, right, away from maybe very high levels. And, you know, another thing I talk about in the book is that, there's some divides you shouldn't really um, bridge, right? That there are some times where it's like, no, animosity can be a good thing, right? Because it's highlighting that these are real and meaningful um, policy consequences. So, you know, what I, when people, so, and there are certainly political scientists who, who disagree with me um, on these things, but, you know, what I found pretty consistently in this work is that um, people have pretty strong misperceptions of the other side, right? So that if you ask people, you know, how politically engaged, if you're a Democrat, if I'm a Democrat and I, you know, 
uh, get asked by server surveyor. Uh, you know, how extreme do you think Republicans are ideologically extreme? Oh, very, very, very right wing. And how politically interested do you think you know Republicans are? Very, you know, political. But uh, the reality is that most people are kind of like, yeah, they're to Democrats to the left, Republicans to the right, but they're a little bit to the left or the right, not all the way to the left or the right. And that most people actually just aren't very interested in politics. Like that's a very consistent finding going back to, you know, classic works by, you know, in the 19, like 40s, uh, you know, people, um, you know, Legends of the Field, Barrel Say and Lazarus Fell, you know, early work by Phil Converse and others, right? Politics isn't that important to most people, yet we tend to think about people for whom politics is very important. So if I am a Republican and I get asked to think about like, well, what does a Democrat look like? I don't think about just kind of like an ordinary Democrat who doesn't care that much about politics. I think about, you know, someone who I see wearing their, you know, feel the burn t-shirt and who goes to, you know, Bernie Sanders rallies and tweets about politics all the time on Twitter and is on Facebook, right? These people who are very, very unrepresentative. So we tend to think about these people who are these very visible, you know, very extreme sort of exemplars. Um, and so, and there's, you know, studies that have been done along many, many different dimensions of this that people just very consistently tend to overestimate um, negative traits of the other side, right? So they tend to think they have less support for democracy, more support for political divide, political violence. Um, they're more extreme, right? Uh, they're less willing to compromise than they actually are, right? So in a way where you can see a lot of the strategies that I'm doing, right, is trying to use some sort of either common identity or real world experience to get people to say like, wait a minute, maybe that's not actually true, right? That, okay, there are some cases where we can do this. And again, you're not going to um eliminate this but you can see how you can maybe slowly build towards something a little bit more constructive mm -hmm. right uh well i think that the that with with the animosity levels high we can really do that thing where we um uh sort of do turn everything into we we, we apply a political lens with a much greater amount and quicker you know we're more rapid we're more quick to sort of judge and 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 have our emotional brain sort of kick in and um and i think that makes a, a challenging problem when you're we're dealing with nuanced issues where you know like you say there's the perception gap issue as well where you know pe people probably even on both sides are more have more in common about some of those issues but we immediately sort of take it we start looking more at who said it you know in what context this kind of thing and and we stop caring about what the actual issue what what the actual issue bullet points are yeah i know you mentioned i heard you say the word incentives <laughs> and and it seems like a lot of the incentives of this whole system um kind of drive towards a lot of this because it seems like there's a lot of winners in having people agitated and angry all the time and and having that animosity up there you've got the media players but also the politicians and 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 uh and it's good for raising money for all those players. So, I mean, you know, I, I, I've sort of come to the point that maybe these incentives can only change mostly from the, the bottom up. But do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, are there structural things that could happen or any ideas about how we might improve the situation regarding the incentives to be more I mean, simple and so on? The incentives are just that's a it's a tough problem to, to crack for the sort of reasons Um that you identified right so that's why in some ways in the you know one of the things i i talked about in the book was just it's really hard to know how to fix stuff in congress right so a very smart group of, of political scientists i wasn't part of it um who tried to wrote a, a book funded by the hewlett foundation where they tried to come up with solutions for congress and um, there were a couple that were some sort of minor, you know, kind of changes you could make to doing things that did something. But um, to be honest, most of it was just sort of either non-starters or just not effective, um, which I think just shows you that it's a really, really hard problem. Um, so that's in part why I said, well, let's think about this problem that's maybe more fixable. Um, and that's a way of thinking about, well, how might we improve just sort of relations between more sort of ordinary Democrats um, and Republicans, right? Um, 
And so I think there, there's a lot to be said for the ways in which you might structure kind of dialogue and debate a little bit better to help people get a better understanding of people from the other side. Yeah, and not be so quick to <laughs> turn on all those emotions and, and, and not, not, not engage anymore. It's, it's so easy to do, though. I mean, we find ourselves doing that a lot. And I ask, I, my ask for a lot of my audience is to sort of be critical, look, look inwardly and then sort of be critical of your own side when they're sort of doing these things to try to get you agitated. Yeah, um, and I think one of the, the things I sometimes say to people, um, you know, and they're like, well, like, what does this mean practically? You know, sometimes I think an interesting kind of spark for conversation can be, What's something where you're disappointed in your own side, right? Because we tend to sort of say like, what's something that, you know, I like about being a Democrat, I like about being a Republican or why, you know, support uh, Trump or don't support Biden or whatever. But I think it can be interesting to say like, what's something where you're, you know, we tend to frame that as like, what is my side doing well or what is the other side doing poorly? But what's something where your own side disappoints you or maybe where you disagree or you agree, sorry, with the, the other side and disagree with your own side? Is maybe opening up a space for conversation that's a little bit more interesting, right? Because again, we tend to think about people as, you know, being all kind of A or B, when in reality, people are kind of a, a mishmash of a lot of different opinions, right? That we know that most people um, are in step with their party on some issues, but out of step with them, their party on a lot of other issues. And that people's opinions and identities are kind of complex and multifaceted um, in a way that doesn't always neatly kind of fit the partisan divide. Right. I mean, that's one of those cases where, you know, and again, because of our bubbles, sometimes this can be hard. But if we can kind of establish a conversation with somebody we know, like you say, maybe in, from a sports fan that we have other stuff in common with, like the sports fan or something like that, or we're both interested in fire safety in our town or something like that some kind of a cross-cutting idea and maybe we can replace when we think republican or democrat we can sort of replace that caricature that you're kind of talking about with this actual human that we know uh, i think that kind of thing can help where you start to realize that there are normal people that you yeah you, you see this person and you hang out with them and you know they're they're pretty normal yeah and i think there's um i add two things to that so one uh so I did a set of discussion experiments with someone who's the the time of postdoc here at Penn. He's now a assistant professor at Colorado State in the set of Penn um, undergrad RAs, um, or we traveled around. Uh, so obviously this is pre-COVID. Um, the metro Philadelphia area, right, largely the kind of exurbs and, and suburbs uh, of the city, to try and get a little more partisan balance. Uh, and we had these uh, discussion conversations between Democrats and, and Republicans, and so we tried to pull apart a little bit, well, was it that people found out that they maybe agreed more than they thought they did? Or was it that people sort of saw that people from the other side were maybe a little more reasonable than they had thought? And both things kind of happen. And obviously those two things are gonna influence one another. If you find out that you agree more, right? You'll think that they, uh, you know, they're also more reasonable, but it seems like right, that both of those things matter. And I think that second point is a big part of it that you know, it wasn't that people agreed on everything at the end of the conversation, right? In fact, sometimes people would talk about explicitly things they didn't agree on. Um, but I, what happens is I think people say like, okay, well, you actually have some real reason that you think this, right? Um, so it's not just that, you know, you've been duped by the media or you've been, you know, hornswoggled by Trump, right? You're like, okay, well, you have some actual reason. I disagree with it, but at least there's some reason behind why you think X or you think Y, right? Um, and so that's an area where we're particularly bad. Uh, we know from psychology, like we have a really, really poor understanding of why other people feel that the, you know, believe what they believe, right? So hearing that can be, you know, in a kind of civil conversation can be really important. And the second thing which builds off of that is that when people ask me for the single most important thing that I learned doing um, these studies, it's that listening is more important than talking. And again, that sounds sort of trivial, but it's, I think actually quite profound. Um, it's especially profound for academics who love to hear their own voice. <laughs> um, so I, what I, uh, why I think that's important is that we tend to 
think we know what other people are going to say, but when we actually take a step back and really try to, you know, actively and engaged, have active engaged listening, right, that forces us to really process what people are saying in a very kind of deep way. Right, because I think we're often trying to figure out like, well, how are we going to make the next point? Right, what's the rebuttal that we're going to say to someone else? Um, because the other thing that one of the other things I like to tell people is that understanding has to come before persuasion, right? So that people sometimes say, well, but they're wrong on the other side, and you know, my rebuttal to them is that's fine, but you understand one, they think that you're wrong, and two, that you won't ever persuade them of anything until you understand why they believe what they believe, right? So that you have to be willing to engage with people in a sincere and good faith effort and that, uh, to understand them. And that requires a kind of deep listening, right? And until that happens, there's effectively no hope for you know persuasion. So even if your goal is ultimately to persuade the other side, which is, uh, as we know from lots of other work, a very, very challenging goal, right? You have to, at a minimum, start with better understanding them. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, and I, and I, I, I think another aspect, if you go into the conversation knowing you're going to try to do that listen mode and, and you're going to actively think that, I think that helps too, because then you don't react as quickly because you know I'm not going to react. First, I'm going to hear and listen, and I'm not going to just immediately come back with a comebacker because I think sometimes that's what our first reaction like you mentioned is but if you I think it's almost like an immune, immunization a little bit to tell yourself ahead of time you're not going to do that and you're actually going to listen as that gives I think like you say some more opportunity to think about it but you know and one thing I've observed and maybe you can tell to see if, how this relates to some of the stuff you've seen very informal and very unscientific because it's kind of people that self-select but I, but I try to interview people and, and I do that where I just completely go into listen mode and I talk to them about their use of media and, and things like that and their, how they may have been affected in social media and, and things like that and I've tried to make these very non political questions or they're not partisan questions they don't really lean one way or the other just kind of about your own personal behaviors and stuff and you know, one thing I get out of that is I think what I call it, I'm calling it kind of a worldview gap. I think it, there's also been kind of this language of, of, of a fact gap where, you know, because we're in our bubbles a lot, when we do run into somebody somewhere else on the political spectrum and, you know, they throw out a thing and because it very ties into what you were just saying about how we have a hard time, like they're just wrong, right? Well, it's the other side thinks you're wrong too. We have a hard time seeing how they came to that conclusion. Like supposedly they must just be, they don't have the right facts. Let me give them more facts so that'll straighten them out or whatever. And I think when we first hear one of these things, it can be far apart, like to where you really go into this mode where well, this person's literally insane. Like we can't imagine how they got to this crazy worldview that they have. And I think sometimes that will derail you unless you've been a little bit, inoculated to that as well to sort of expect that like people have different worldviews than you and came to different conclusions with the same facts and you're just not used to it because you're so much in your bubble and so both sides think they're saying something normal but they're so far apart and then they're just kind of shocked and the conversation doesn't go anywhere yeah there's a, a phenomenon that psychologists call naive realism where it's just sort of like well i'm a good person i'm a smart person and this is how i view the world so of course any logical person who saw the same set of facts would arrive at the same conclusion, right? When, you know, we fail to account for, you know, people's different experiences and values in a way um, that makes it hard for us to understand um, where they're coming from. There's a, a number of the groups that try to do this there. They broadly call themselves the bridging um, community. The, uh, they're trying to basically foster more conversations between People have different points of views. A number of them have a sort of explicit rule along those lines of like the first, especially the initial conversation is not about persuasion or judgment. It's just about kind of like, where are you? Where am I? Like, let's kind of explore that and see how we can, you know, build from that. I think, you know, kind of reflecting that same kind of idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, you know, okay. So, uh, so now the book has been out for a while. What, when did the book come out? uh the beginning of march i guess mid-march okay. something like that okay awesome yeah all right well um i i want to make sure i thank you that for for making the time to come on again and i don't know if you had any other kind of parting thoughts or parting comments for us uh, i think the one last thing that uh, i sometimes say that maybe kind of fits with this is that 
you know, there's a lot of work that shows that people don't like having political conversations because they tend to think about conversations with people who are really extreme, but that sometimes just having ordinary conversations with people who are a little bit less political can be a way of trying these things out. So don't necessarily go into things with like a something where it's really high stakes, um, but just try having like maybe small kind of conversations with ordinary people, right? And kind of see how you can maybe build from that uh, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, it, it definitely can be challenging because some people just go from zero to 100 really quickly. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. <laughs> yeah, it definitely can be a little challenging there. Well, again, thanks thanks for making the time. I really appreciate it. And um, good, good luck with the book. I'll definitely be promoting it. Um, a lot because I, I really love this idea. Like I say, so much is out there trying to tell us what's wrong, but not a lot telling us what we might be able to do about it. All right. Well, thanks so much. And uh, thanks for taking the time to talk with me and have a great day. Yeah, thanks. You as well. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That is it for this episode of the Outrage Overload podcast. For links to everything we talked about on this episode, go to outrageoverload.net. I want to take a moment to, again, thank all the listeners and contributors. If you have a question, please send it. Email me at outrageoverload at gmail.com. I'll make sure every question gets an answer, so keep them coming. And if you received any value from today's episode, please return that value, value for value as we call it, by going to outrageoverload.net slash contribute and buy me a coffee or better yet for as little as three dollars a month you can become a subscriber to get access to exclusive subscriber only content and other perks thanks for listening and check back in a few weeks for a fresh new episode <laughs>